your question in terms of gold and Bitcoin. I'll answer those at the end. Uh, uh, some I'll try and answer during, but others I'll answer at the end if you don't mind, if that's okay. Japan, Mark. Wow, I was out there recently. Uh, well, recently, a couple of years ago. So welcome, one and all. Um, I like to choose different opening screens. So this is one from uh, a series of talks I gave in Korea in 2019. <laughs> and I am missing travel. And you can see that I'm missing travel. That's why I've done this. So you should be able to see my screen. You should be able to hear me loud and clear. Let's get on with it. Um, now, a lot of the, the, the content I'm going to give you is based not just on my experiences as a fund manager for uh, soon approaching 20 years but also as a private investor and from my books. The Financial Times will be publishing this hopefully at some point during this year, well, as soon as I get a final manuscript over to them. Uh, so they are. this is going to be book number 19, would you believe? I did my very first one in 1997 when John Major was prime minister. Yeah, uh, so that far back, and I was in my 20s. Uh, and the Financial Times have been a great publisher for me, as have others. And I'm going to give you some books that you can download during the course of this webinar as well. Not just mine, not just this, which became an international bestseller, uh, but others you can download for free because people don't read books. So you're going to get some of that. So this is one of the places my uh, content is going to come from, just so you know. I'm just establishing my credentials for anybody who's new. Uh, and the reason that's important is otherwise, why would you listen to me if I don't have any credentials? Problem number one, I mentioned this yesterday, we've got this huge fear of missing out. We're seeing some great gains. And not that I own any of these. The only one I've spoken about in the last three months has been Ocugen, Um, And I don't own it. Uh, and you might say, well, what are you talking about if you don't own it? Well, because like you, of course, I look at this and I think to myself, wait a minute, what the hell's going on? You know, I have fears of missing out as well. Uh, uh, everybody does. But well, how do we make a sensible process that we can get reasonable, sensible returns without gambling and, and, and punting and speculating? I'm not in the business of speculation or gambling, okay? So the fact that I miss relief therapeutics, I don't care because guess how many darts I would have had to throw or how many uh, throw of the dice I would have had to have made which have been losing in order just to have found one relief therapeutics, right? So obviously, you got to weigh it up in that way. So we're going to talk about this issue as well, which is how do we make sure we are not going to be missing out? And speaking of missing out, I've asked on the poll, will the FTSE 100 be higher by the end of 2021 from today's level? 62% of you have said yes, 62%. A majority of you have said yes. Then there's good and bad news in that. Good news is if we're buying stocks and you're right, wonderful. Bad news, retail investors tend to be wrong. <clears throat> so my view is I don't gamble on which way the markets are going to move. I make sure, a bit like buying a house, I just make sure location, 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 that, hey, if the market rises, my property price goes up. If it doesn't, it'll take longer for me to make my money. But I'm going to make sure at least I control the things I control when I pick my stocks or when I pick my home. In, with homes, it's location. With stocks, it's other factors. So I'm going to discuss what those other factors are. Okay. Uh, the first part of this webinar is about the problems. Now, I'm going to keep that really short. I'm going to try and keep that to 10 minutes. And then solutions, which is what we really want. I'm going to keep the rest of the webinar for that. So who's this for? 30-somethings have worried they've not been investing properly. 40 to 50-somethings worried their pension sips and ices are off track. And 60 to 70-somethings worried uh, there's not enough time for the grandkids. Oh, there's not enough money for the grandkids. Now, if you've got a 100K portfolio and you've got a 10% improvement, thanks to what I'm going to teach you, uh, in the next 12 months, then this 60-minute webinar or 85-minute webinar is worth 10K to you. If you've got a million-pound portfolio, maybe not today, maybe you'll have it in five years, okay, and you get a 10% improvement in just the next 12 months alone, or when you've got that portfolio, that's 100K. Uh, what's 100,000 pounds divided by 85 minutes? You do the maths, you know, that means this is worth a fair bit of your time. Uh, okay, it's about 1,250 pounds uh, per minute that I'm going to give you uh, a value if you've got that one million pound portfolio and through the education you get a 10% improvement. So I think uh, that that tends to be uh, something which is worthwhile uh, being um, a bit watching. All right. Uh, now, my my day job is not educating private investors like the rest of you. I've got a day job. I've got an asset management company. OK, you guys have got grandkids or you know, day jobs, better things to do than this. But we want our money to work for us. 
that passive income or that passive capital gain, just like our properties, which everybody understands property. So I'll give that analogy uh, uh, is critical. But we always we always think about buying a home. But we always neglect the fact that, well, if we invest, then at the click of a keyboard, we can get out. We're not stuck. OK, um, we're getting clever people in those companies like Square or PayPal or Microsoft working hard for us to generate as a return. Um, and that's critical because otherwise your money's inefficient and it means you're working really hard, but you're foolish because that money's sitting there and that could have been generating an equal income to what you're earning in your day job, right? And so that's why this is important. I have no conflict of interest with you. I am not a long only retail fund manager. Let me explain what that means. Uh, we don't have funds for the retail audience because we're a hedge fund. Hedge funds aren't allowed to uh, uh, offer their services to retail clients. So that's one thing. I don't have a conflict of interest in you. We're not long only, but I certainly know about this area. And I don't just mean that from the books that I've written and the Financial Times columns and the Bloomberg TV shows, but also as an asset manager. So I want to share that know-how. And the reason I want to share that now is because I've been doing it for over 20 years, sharing that know-how through my TV programs and the like. OK, uh, so that's one reason why I want to share that now. By the way, during this, I'm going to have to keep an eye on my phone only because I'm expecting a text from the BBC. The UK um, signed a trade deal with uh, uh, India today. And Philip Hampshire, who many of you might remember, uh, uh, I've had interviews with on the BBC and also from my time at Bloomberg. We were there together as well. Uh, wants to interview me for the, my comments on that trade deal. So I might just need to, for three seconds, just give him a time when he texts back. Okay, so no conflict of interest with you guys. Uh, the other thing I need to disclose to you is this. All investing is risky, okay? It is not a bank account. I've got to tell you that. It's not a bank account. Now, you all know this, but it's only right to remind you it's not a bank account. However, if you want to gamble or you want to double your money by tomorrow, please leave. This is not for gamblers. This is not for people who say, hey, Alpesh, I want to throw some money. Uh, I've got so much. I just want to throw it at a punt at something. Is there a, is, do you have some inside information on the next therapeutics company or the next crypto company or the next Bitcoin thing uh, where I can just take a gamble? Uh, no, I don't. Please go look on the Internet for that. OK, I'm sure there's lots of people who if you give your phone number on the Internet somewhere, they'll be calling you within minutes to take your money off your hands. This isn't that webinar. Right. So we're here for sensible. My investments are for my retirement and for my son's inheritance. If you're in your 30s, it's to start you on the right track. So when you look back 20 years from now, you think to yourself, thank God I started 20 years ago. OK, it's as simple as that. So what are the problems we're going to solve? And I'm just going to take five minutes to go through the problems because solutions are what people are more interested in. The problems are these we're going to solve in this webinar. Problem two, rich people's secrets. OK, rich people like to keep their secrets. Of course they do. Right. Why wouldn't they? So this pisses me off. Right. UBS rich clients get Goldman PIMCO strategies with an extra fees. So I'm going to share with you actual slides of what those strategies are that Goldman's and UBS's rich clients share amongst each other. Why would I do that? Well, there's no skin off my nose. Uh, and I quite like being Robin Hood, quite like sharing the information I get as a hedge fund. I get this data crossing my desk because they want us to do what they're all doing and they want to share their value and they want us as a client and they want us to broker through them and blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't see a problem sharing that with you guys. Why not? Why not? Um, you know, what are they going to do to me? Uh, you sort of stop speaking to me? No. Right. So I'm going to share that with you. That's a problem. Rich people have secrets they don't share with others. Well, I want to. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. I cut, I was born in Leeds. Uh, no silver spoon in my mouth. And you don't get social mobility unless you get networks who improve your net worth. And that's my job. I'm, my job is to be part of your network. Connect with me on LinkedIn, by the way, uh, because your networks determine your net worth. And if I don't share this information with you, how would you get socially mobile and, and do even better? Okay, then you're already, I'm sure many of you are doing. Uh, also, people like me will have access to, this is from 16th of June, all right? 16th of June, look at that, right? And what does that say? Ripe for rally, NASDAQ poised for gains, a share of overheated members is well below average. Now. We get that amongst ourselves and we think to ourselves, all oh, right, OK, that's contrary to what everybody seemed to be saying back in June of last year, that the Nasdaq's going to shoot ahead. Everyone's oh, it was overvalued, overvalued, no chance, no chance, no chance. OK, so I want to try and give you some insights that we get as well, right, which you might not have access to. And I think that's right and fair. I also want to give you insights into what we do that you can copy. Now, if you look at, say, something like an apple, all right. We don't just say, hey, buy some Apple. Right. They don't pay us the big bucks to come up with the obvious stuff. And the obvious stuff works well. By the way, I'm an Apple shareholder. 
We'll also, I want to share with you how, well, how do we decide who are their suppliers, right? How well are their suppliers doing? Uh, and which one of their suppliers should we be looking to get into? Or how well are their customers doing? Okay, which one of their customers might we want to be uh, uh, buying into? Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Not all good, not all suppliers are worth getting into. So we, we want to look at different ways in which we do this that you can share in. There's another problem. Like I said, the fear of missing out. The S&P 500 hit record highs, yet there's a lot of people saying, no, I'm too busy working to be investing in Arpesh. I don't want to spend one hour with you because I'm too busy working and the market keeps rising. So what they do is they're, they're like a little mouse on a, on a wheel going like this crazy in their day job, right? Like we all do. And God bless the people who sort of are like that. Uh, and they're earning all this money. It sits in a bank account. And Barclays Bank pays you 0.1% and then they go and spend it for you. That does not make sense to me. You know, I got into entrepreneurship, got into business, got into asset management because I was fundamentally lazy. I just like the idea of me giving some, I'm a capitalist. I like the idea of giving capital to PayPal or Square or Globant or CDW or Amazon or Apple and letting them work really hard and give me a return. Now, I think that's an unfair system. Why should the capitalists get the return? And don't give me some BS about, well, you took the risk, Alpesh. No, I didn't. I, you know, they took the risk, but I get the return. Uh, and I like that. Okay. It really pissed off Karl Marx, but I like that whole idea. So I want you to benefit from that. Hazards of ill timing. That's the other thing. Okay. Um, uh, of course, David, of course, I'll make sure and I fully understand hazards of ill timing. This is the other thing. And I want you to remember this. So not only has, say, the S&P, which is just a proxy of 500 American stocks, but we'll look at UK and global stocks as well. Uh, I want you to consider this. Investors sitting out the S&P's 500's best days would have suffered a 30% loss. Now, just think about that. What that's saying is this. People say to me, oh, but it's an all-time high. I'll just set it out until it dips and I'll buy the dip. Hey, I would love to have a crystal ball and a time machine and buy the dips as well, because then I would be... I would own all the money in the world. So would some, nobody's invented that time machine that I'm aware of. Okay, if they have, they haven't told anybody else. Okay, so what happens? I am fully invested in rolling 12-month periods. And sometimes when the market falls, my stocks drop as well. But they fall less than others because we pick resilient stocks. How do we do that? I'll teach you. And then they rebound more. That's the trick. So I still sleep easy because I can't control the market. I can control what I can do. And what I do is make sure we've got resilient stocks. And one other reason why I don't wait for dips and all the rest of it. Remember, I'm not trying to sell you a fund and I'm not a stockbroker. I'm not saying, hey, use our services and please buy, 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 buy. I've got no conflict of interest with you. But if you don't put your money in the market, there's no skin off my nose. What I know is that your employer through the employer's pension scheme is giving it to a fund manager who's fully invested. You better believe they're fully invested. So believe it or not, your pension, where you work at the NHS as a nurse or whether you work for, I don't know, a machinery company, that pension's invested in equities and they're fully invested. So you might think you're sitting it out, but you're not, all right? So you need to know if you're gonna manage your own SIP or ISA or 401k or whatever, how do you do it? So we don't try and time it, okay? And this is the exact reason why is what you see on screen. Right. And there's another problem. Investors have been urged to move 50 billion pounds held in underperforming dog funds. Most fund managers, the data and the research, not just in my books, and you're going to get a copy of it because it's going to show you all the research done by universities, academia, fund managers tend to underperform the markets. OK, now you'll say to me, no, no, no. Warren Buffett. Yeah, there might be one who did in the 60s, 70s and 80s outperform and now has got an insurance company. This is basically an insurance business, uh, which which uh, hasn't actually outperformed the S&P for the last 20 years. If you look at his 20 year chart record, they haven't. Right. That's one great one genius. The rest tend to underperform. So we want to make sure you're managing it. And one of the key reasons for underperformance is they collect so much money that they can only invest in the biggest companies. Otherwise, they'd end up taking over companies which aren't the biggest. And by biggest, I don't mean the biggest thousand to choose from. I'm talking about the biggest hundred they can choose from. So no wonder they underperform. They've got a narrow gene pool they're selecting from. Uh, and that's what happens when you give it to them. So don't give it to them. Instead, we're going to pick from 9,000 equities, 9,000 global equities, UK, because they can all go in your SIP and ISA, UK, US. And you might say, oh, well, obviously it costs five pounds more to buy a US stock. Yeah, if you're making thousands of pounds more return, what the hell do you care? It costs five pounds more to buy a US stock than a UK one. We're not just looking at US, Chinese stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, the Indian companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so we're going to open out the gene pool 
to 9,000 companies, 9,000 companies. There's another problem I'm gonna solve for you. This was on September the 20th, this article was written, I think in, in oh, Trustnet. More than a trillion pounds of Muppet money is costing savers billions, that's their term, Muppet money. And what they're referring to is the fact that there's a whole load of money in ISAs and savings accounts doing nothing. And that's costing savers billions because they're getting no return and the stock market keeps getting all time highs, okay? Uh, so we need to know how to do it. And I'm not saying, oh, well, that, oh, cause that's all well and good, but it just happens to have been a good 12 months for the stock market. Well, no, I'm not just saying, oh, let's just buy some stocks willy nilly. What I'm saying is we're gonna have an approach where if there's a bad 12 months, then our stocks won't drop as much as the rest of the market and they'll rebound. So it's a bit like, uh, 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 just like I said, with property, it used to be in the good old days, property doubled every three years. And if there was a recession in the middle, it took five years. Well, that's what we want with our uh, stocks. If there's a recession in the middle, it take five years for us to get our great returns. And if less, uh, uh, if there isn't, and there's a boom, then it'll take less time. That's it. We can't make the market move. I'm going to share with you how I come about picking certain things. Okay. Uh, how did, wh why would I pick, say, two times leveraged Amazon? That's not for everyone. That's higher risk. Warning, that's higher risk. Two times leveraged. Why didn't you do 10 times? I never do more than two times. Okay. How do I come to some of these? What are their performances over what time frames? What am I targeting? Well, actually, I'm targeting a 40% return per annum. Some years it's more, some years it's less. Okay, if it's only UK stocks, then only 20% per annum because UK stocks tend to deliver less returns. Uh, but when it's global, uh, and it's not me delivering it, so that, you know, let me let me lift the curtain up. It's it's a blooming best of the best delivering it. By the way, I didn't know who the hell they were until we did the analysis and thought, oh, that's interesting. It'll be somebody else. It'll be an Amazon or whoever delivering it. So how do we come to these names? These are not these are not recommendations for today. Today's list will be different to what I might have picked you know, a few months ago, uh, and so on. And why do I not just pick one of these then? Well, because look, in hindsight, yeah, sure, I should have just picked an apple and put everything into that. Hey, great, fine, just like a house. Most people own one house, that's it. They put all their money into that, don't they? Uh, but we don't obviously diverse because you never know what's gonna happen in the world. So how do you come up with some of these? This is not to say, oh, buy these today, because what I might've bought a year ago or six months ago is different to what I might buy today, so we'll come to that. But the reason I'm showing you this is so you know what the goal is, and I, I want to talk specifics as how do we drill down and pick these, okay? Um, uh, Jazza said, you have to declare your ISA profits. No, uh, profits within an ISA are tax-free. They're tax-exempt. So there's nothing to declare in your self-assessment tax form uh, within your ISA because it's tax-exempt. So the taxman can't say, you didn't tell us about your investment. They're tax-free. Okay, they're tax free. And in any event, any capital gains, you have an annual allowance of what is it, twelve and a half thousand or something on top of that. And were you to do a 12 month holding, let's say you had so much cash, you'd use up all your SIP allowances, all your ISA allowances. Uh, and I'm not saying you should necessarily do this and, and your capital gains tax allowance. I'm not saying you necessarily should do this. Uh, but what I do is I have 12 month holding periods in, in, in a spread bet, a long term spread bet, because that's capital gains tax free as well. Uh, so but that, you know, is you, you've got to be careful with that because you might you don't want to take some uh, unexpected uh, mar um, leverage which you didn't plan to do, uh, including my son's uh, stuff. So some of these are his holdings, and I've um, lost uh, the ones on the left are his. So these are my son's: Amazon, Alphabet, Netflix, Apple. Now don't say to me, "Oh, should I still hold Netflix?" Now we'll come to all of this later. I'm just showing you some of the things and the goals that we're trying to achieve, and it's not me doing it. It's like I said, the best of the best. Why have I got three times leverage S&P 500? I'll answer all of those questions as we go along. And w which ones do better? Which ones do? Well, I'll answer all of that. And these are just some of them. And I'll come to these as well. Uh, Anil, yes, you need to change your broker. Uh, the, you're absolutely right. Um, I think Hargreaves Lansdowne allow that. Uh, I quite like free trade as a broker at the moment as well, because free trade you know uh the, the things in there yeah so some brokers like vanguard will only they want to push you towards their products so they'll limit what you can do because they hate you going off and doing your own thing you know because then they can't charge you fees for forcing you to do their thing so yeah some brokers they'll 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 handcuff you so change brokers my friend problem picks this is how people are picking stocks at the moment yeah they, just, they hear a name on the news or somewhere and they're gambling and they think oh and they don't know how long to hold it for and what to do we're going to remove that problem in this webinar the other one is they don't know when to let go so i'm going to remove that problem for you by creating a very simple simple solution they also don't know who to trust okay 
Uh, and this is when I did this slide when the S&P was at 2,900. And this was Wall Street's outlook for 2020. And you can look at how the S&P ended up in 2020. And you can see that every single one of these guys, and I'm talking people from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Barclays, uh, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, not only did some of them not even know whether it was going to be lower than today or higher, they were miles off. So they can't, the, Wall Street isn't one entity which has got some clever inside information. They can't even agree on, uh, 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 on, on um, direction. Can you put bullion into a SIP? I don't know, Lewis. I don't know. I'm not a gold specialist at all. I know you can put gold stock, but I, I couldn't tell you whether you can put uh, it into a bullion into a SIP, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, on that. I can look into it, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so let's look at, let's focus on solutions. The most important part, this is what you really care about. Solutions, all right? So problems, we're going to try and remove all of those. So let's look at solutions. One solution I want you to adopt is we're going to increase the gene pool of stocks we look at, right? Now, you can't do that if you put all your money with a fund manager because they've got, they'll have a UK growth and a Japan. You might say, well, no, no, that's all right. I'll just have lots of fund managers. I put money with, well, wait a minute, UK growth means they're going to have bought 100 bloody stocks in UK companies. And then the Japanese growth has put another 100 there and you've got your costs on those. They're going to be churning them. No wonder they underperform the market. Okay, they spread the money thin into a narrow gene pool of companies and then they're charging you administration fees, custodian fees, brokerage fees. And I'm going to show you how much fees. They take 10% of your capital every five years, the typical fund. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you the images. They yeah, they take 0.5%, honestly. Yeah, and they've just been busted for lying about it as well in one of the uh, several of the newspapers. And I've written an article about this last week on my blog, which is on... Um, TraderMind.com forward slash news is my blog. Uh, but anyway, I'll give you the links later on. So we're going to increase the gene pool. Why are we going to increase the gene pool? Well, because I want to be able to pick out of this universe. That's the 12-month performance of those. Now, that's fine. That The principle here is not buy this. The principle I'm saying to you, we're going to increase the gene pool. Okay, What we're going to buy out of this gene pool, we're going to come to. But for now, principle solution number one, let's make sure we're looking at 9,000 stocks and not just uh, one or two of them, okay? Not just one of two of them uh, uh, as well. And and this is the article I've written on, on uh, anyway, if later on you want to have a look at it, The Truth About Hidden Fees and Fund Manager Charges. Uh, it's on trademind.com forward slash news, forward slash news, okay? And it's quite a detailed article. And I, by the way, I reference the sources of data, breakdown of fees as well, um, uh, and and how they're screening you. And now, for instance, Hargreaves Lansdowne, uh, have been screwing people and some of the others and what their charges are. And I've broken it all down into great details. I won't go into that now, all right? Um, and, you know, for instance, why the Times it wrote this, is it time to quit Harvey's Land? I'm not just picking on them. There's a load of others as well. And you might have missed all of this in terms of hidden fees. And the hidden fees are still there. Uh, and I've given the data and the sources. And the sources include investigative journalism from people like the Sunday Times and the Telegraph, all right? So that's a separate issue. Let's assume you agree with me for now. So principle number one, we're going to increase the gene pool. Then we've got to work out from that gene pool, how do we pick stocks? Okay, and that gene pool includes world stocks. So over the last 12 months, these are companies, for instance, from China, okay, Alibaba. Now, I'm not saying I necessarily would buy that, but what I'm saying is I need to be looking into all of these. So how do we look into them? Now that we agree that we should have a bigger gene pool of candidates we interview for our portfolio, okay, then what I need to do is from that, just keeping an eye on, uh, Philip's text message. Uh, I won't leave you in the middle of the webinar, by the way, to do the BBC interview, although maybe you want to listen to it uh, as we record it and what my view on the UK India trade deal is. Right. So there we go. We're going to look at that. So that's a simple point. The other reason we want to look at this increased gene pool is this image, right? This is the poverty gap. Over the last five years, if you only invested in UK fund managers and UK stocks, which is what most British people do, and I'm a proud Brit, then you would have got a, a, a negative 12% return. Uh, and that's a positive 128% return. That gap's actually got wider since I took that image uh, last summer. It's actually got wider. Any rolling five-year period, you'll always be worth, worse off since the Second World War uh, and only having UK compared to uh, the US as well. Now, this is not just something as simple as saying, oh, just buy American. That's what I'll push it. Okay, I'll go now. No, because we've still got to pick the right ones. 90% of the stocks you shouldn't own. And just to reinforce that point, this is one of my uh, students. This is one of their typical bad portfolios. And I asked the guy, why the hell did you pick these given? Look at that. 
this is, you know, he'd been doing pretty badly over the preceding six months. He was down 44%, 45%, 44%, 40, 52. I said, why the hell did you pick these? And he said, oh, because uh, they're names I recognize. So we did some analysis. We looked at these other factors like croquis, sortina, and I'll come to that in a second, valuation, growth, income. And we said, we wouldn't have picked any of these, okay? None of them uh, uh, give us green lights all the way through. The closest would have been Howden Joyner, and even that failed because sortina, which is a measure of return, versus the risk of missing a return. So a high, you know, it's all very well having a, say, take cricket, having 50, 50, runs, and, 50 runs a match average, right, return, runs. Uh, but if you miss it, because in one game you go out for a duck and another you get 100, that's not as good as somebody who keeps getting 50 every single day, right, every single game. So that's what Sortino measures. What's the average return, but what's the chances of hitting it? We want the chances of hitting it to be high as well as the return to be high. And none of his stocks met that, even though he had name recognition. And we did that in five seconds. He gave us the names. Five seconds later, my um, team sent me this back. Well, not five seconds, maybe five minutes later, they sent this back. And we looked at it and I said, you're nuts. Why would you have done that? And, and he went with name recognition. Now, other people said, yeah, but Alpesh, look, guess what? Um, Centrica's up now. It, it lost 52%, but it's back up to where it was. And I said, right. So he wasted a whole bloody year to go on the roller coaster ride of being down 50% and then back to where he was. Whilst in that same year, my stocks went up 100%. So he got a 0% return. I got a 100% return because it was such a great year, uh, unexpectedly great year in the markets. And you're saying that's fine that he held it. Are you kidding me? Because some people become so obsessed with uh, justifying their mistakes and justifying fund manager exists and they become apologists for it and they can't see beyond it and what can you do they stay poor that's up to them so again some names i'm throwing not ones necessarily today i would pick but these were the ones over the last 12 months why did we not just pick any one of them well because if it was only going to be one then i would have been too concentrated in risk so the rules i have are 12 15 25 12 15 25 write that down 12 months then review might keep holding it for the next 12 months but usually not 12 months 15 stocks, and I'll tell you why 15 in a second, though some might do 20, money divided equally between them. And if any drops 25% from the highest they've been, then I exit into cash, okay, in that holding, in that holding. And that means if you've got one fifteenth of your capital in a company and it happens to drop 25% from the, not from the high point since you bought it, so it might have gone up 100% that drops to 75%. But forget that. Let's say it went on day one, it just dropped 25%, which shouldn't happen. But let's say it did, despite all your uh, uh, investing skills, then you're losing only 1.8% of your total portfolio because 1 15th, 1, 25% of 1 15th is about 1.8%. Somebody can do the maths for me in a second and you will see, okay, that. Uh, I also am going to do another poll. I want to publish that as well. Okay. Now, this doesn't mean, oh, but you're going to go buy these. What do you think of these now? No, somebody asked me earlier on TikTok. I do TikTok live. And somebody asked me on TikTok. They said to me, um, Alpesh, uh, 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 can you give me a view on companies if I send you names? I said, there's 9,000 bloody companies. You think I'm going to sit on my backside going through every single name? No, I get the computers to do it. So I'll, ex I'll share and explain some of that to you. And, and like I said, the goal is 40% per annum. Some years better, some years uh, less as well, okay? And I want to make this absolutely clear. It's not me getting the return. It's Trade Desk getting it or Square getting it or PayPal. And by the way, that 40% doesn't include leverage, okay? So leverage is just what I do. I'm not saying anybody else should do it. That doesn't include that. I'm talking non-leverage. So Tech Target got the return. I didn't. I didn't even know that was a multi-billion dollar company and what they did until we looked at, and this is what we look at, and this is the solution I'm going to give you. We look at not just valuation. People think you have only can look at value stocks or growth stocks or income stocks. No, or journalist comment or analyst. And, and so they, they randomly pick something that they've heard, and then they, they do all right sometimes, and they go, oh, now when do I get out? No, we need the boxes ticked. Like when we're hiring staff in my company, valuation, growth, income, write this down, valuation, growth, income, cash flow, and I'll explain all of it as we go through, Sortino and Alpha, valuation, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino and Alpha. There are a few other things we look at, which I'll share with you in a second. Uh, I happen to be, as an aside, I happen to be chairman of the Lumbar Trust alongside uh, Lord Curran Billamoria. Uh, the Lumbar Trust was set up by Lord, um, <laughs> Lord Lumbar to look after widows and orphans. When you make money in investing, if you've looked after your family and you're okay, you're doing all right, all right, 
Uh, please have a think about other things. I'm sure you will, and forgive me for patronizing you uh, and suggesting otherwise, but please have a look and a think about other things uh, to give to. For me, it's this. And you know, if you've got one or two, it makes life a lot easier. It gives greater purpose because, um, especially at this time with what's going on in the world, and I've been chair of that for over a decade. So I'm really pleased to say uh, that. But you'll have your own favorites. For me, it was Widows and Orphans. Uh, you'll have your own favorites. Connect with me on LinkedIn. That old saying, your net worth is connected to your networks. Okay, your net worth is connected to your networks. So connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, all right, it's very easy to find me. It's completely free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Now, let's let's put all this networks, my networks, at your disposal. Let's use all of these networks and, and me, um, as the young kids say, flexing with uh, Clinton or flexing with the former governor of the Bank of England or flexing with, let's put all that to use, okay? Um, so let's let's drill down to value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortina Alpha, so that you know we can quickly find the stocks and life becomes a lot easier. I think it's starting bloody raining again. It's nice living in the Arctic, isn't it? Uh, and this isn't new what I'm giving you. This is proven through time and it's time tested, not just from, you know, 20 years ago and 20 years now, and not just from all the books you see, the 18 books I've written. So I want to make sure you understand it's it's not just been pulled out of the air. It's been vetted, publicized, reviewed. Okay. Um, Anil's asked, is it okay to hold leverage products more than debt? I hold them for 12 months, my friend. I hold them for 12 months. The, the key information documents say a day because they're covering their asses. But look, don't just, you don't, Go and get a leveraged product because you heard the guy talk about it for 60 seconds on a webinar. That requires a one-to-one -one discussion to work out what your risk profile is and work and show you the up and upside and downside. So please don't run off and say, right, Alpesh, I saw a screen for 30 seconds on a webinar. I'm going to buy leveraged products. Oh, my God. Don't do that. Right? Let's discuss it offline before you go nuts. Um, yeah, their key information documents will always say one day for the simple reason they're covering their asses uh, on that. And like I said, I've had mine for over 12 months in most cases. But they're right to say a day because with some of them, it is supposed to be a day because leverage works in a perverse way. So I don't want to sidetrack onto leverage. Don't get distracted by leverage. See, sometimes you'll talk to people about something sensible like Apple and, and they'll see at the corner of the screen, I don't know, they see Bitcoin. Everyone will get glued to Bitcoin and blow their brains out like a casino. Um, and nobody will want to do the sensible thing. So we'll come to the, let's focus on the sensible uh, as well. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to draw in some of the, some of the insights and some of the things we've stolen from JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank as well. Right. My job is to convert every 10K into 3 million, but nobody does that. Nobody does that by saying, oh, I bought Amazon and you just buy and hold forever. We're not at that extreme either. So I say 12 months reviews, because guess what? You shouldn't have held Amazon in 2004 for 12 months or in 2005 or in 2006, okay? It was only in about 2007 it was worth holding. And then in 2008, nothing was. And then in 2009, fine. So what I'm saying to you is this, we're not buy, hold and forget either, because that would be stupid. Because you'd, get, you'd be buy, holding and forgetting a lot of rubbish. And we need to do a better return than that. So even when the stocks are amazing, we still need to review over a 12-month period. This is our financial goal for the solution for value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino Alpha. What are we looking at? These are the goals we're looking at, right? It's important to know what the goal is. Why are you here? This is your destination. This is important you know and understand the destination uh, and the reason you are here. Assume you plan to invest over 10 years, basically for the rest of your life, right? But let's say it's just 10 years. And with my help, you make 20%, not 40, 20, reasonable. The market's going to give you 10% per annum over the long term anyway, okay? So we're only talking about adding an extra 10%, as I said at the beginning of this webinar. But that big that 10% piles up pretty quickly. Some years it'll be more, some years it'll be less. In 2008, nobody got, nobody got anything, all right? Nothing extravagant, nothing pessimistic. Let's say you got 100K in your SIP ISAs, 401ks. You might not have that today. I had somebody saying to me, Arpesh, I've only got 2K. Can I start investing? I said, well, you can certainly start learning. Why the hell would you wait until you're a billionaire? And this is the mistake people make. Oh, I'm going to make 50 million in five years, so I'll just wait till then. No, at least start the education process today, okay? Because uh, next year, you might have 10K. The year after, 20K. 
the year after that, 40 or whatever. All right. So let's say you've got 100K and I'll give the 10K example. So this isn't just for the rich people, right? We'll start with the 10K people in a second. Let's say you just got 100K, never mind a million, never mind 10 million. Uh, and you plan to add one and a half each month, one and a half K a month. Because if you've got 100K, you probably can save one and a half a month. And I'll, like I said, I'll give the, the poorer version in a second. Well, you'll have a million by the end of 10 years with my help. That's that's the idea, 20%. And by the way, when I say with my help, I'm not managing your money. You're managing your money. I'm not a fund manager managing your money. You're managing it. When I say with my help, I mean my education, what I'm teaching you, okay? Uh, uh, my 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 stuff, uh, not, with, not with anything else. And this is what it looks like. And that's our goal. That's one of our goals. Well, actually, 20% is not my run rate. My run rate is more ambitious, but that's me, right? Yours might be 20%. I actually want mine to be 40 uh, for that reason, for the reason that, well, I think with all my skills and abilities and all the rest of it, I should be looking at that, obviously, right? Total contributions there, and that's how you get from zero, well, 100 to a million. Tenfold increase over 10 years, right? I don't give my money to fund managers, because you know what fund managers do? They take 10% of my capital in fees every five years. So those buggers will have taken 10% after five years, 10%, and I'll show to you that's how they do. Now, let's say you've only got 10K. So you're in your 30s, probably. You've only got 10K. So you plan to add 6K a, a year, divided equally each month, so 500 a month. Then your returns look like this with my help. And we're still looking at the conservative 20%. So my son, who's three years old, he started off with, in his junior ISA with, and when he was born with, you know, whatever the allowance was, 5K, 4,800 when he was born. Now it's nine. And the, you know, so he's up to here. And after three years, it looks like, actually, he's a bit ahead of that because, the markets in the last three years, uh, not thanks to me, but the markets have done incredibly well. So he's a bit above this, okay? He's a bit above the run rate. And maybe next year it'll be bad. He'll be back on the run rate, okay? But the idea is he goes from zero to uh, half a million by the time he goes to university. So, you know, by the time he's ready for his A-levels in university, he'll have half a million in his ISA, tax-free, okay? Aside from whatever else he might have, thanks to his parents and grandparents and uh, all the rest of it. Ignore that. I'm just about ISAs, right? This is the goal. And that's if it's 20%. Now, hopefully with his, it should be 40. But let's say it was 20. Let's say I suddenly became rubbish and I only did 20% round. Well, that's what it should be, okay? So that's our that's what we're going for. So let's look at the solutions in more detail on this. Um, and, well, yeah, one major problem is that we need to solve. The solution we need to have is this. I said we're going to look at valuations, but how do you do you really want somebody to teach you the formula for price to earnings ratio price earnings growth price to book price to sales how do we know which one of those factors is important anyway and we know company stock prices move not just on the valuation but also on their growth but we also know that a company with high growth could fall in price and an undervalued company might be undervalued because it's rubbish so we know we can't rely on any one of these factors that's why we're looking at all of them and making sure all the boxes are ticked valuation growth income now, from our research, we know there are certain uh, uh, valuation metrics which are more useful than others, okay? Uh, uh, the research suggests it. So we know something as esoteric as price to sales is not that as good, it's better than nothing, as, as measuring valuation as a predictor of share price as, for instance, price earnings or price earnings growth. Equally, here, same principle. We know cash flow tends to be more important than just sales growth alone. All right. Uh, so I'm going to break that down. But this is just to give you an overview to explain to you how share prices and companies work and their valuations work. So I'm assuming you're a mass audience. Nobody's an expert and everyone's got better things to do than listen to just investing. OK, we, um, 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 we've also got research which suggests that uh, we want to look at their recent performance i.e. momentum. We want to we know companies which pay dividends tend to, as a general rule, there are exceptions to all of this. Uh, tend to perform better in their share price performance than those that don't. But what the fund management industry has led you to believe is that you should have a UK value, a Japanese growth, uh, an emerging market income, and a US momentum fund. So you've got all these funds and all these fund managers you're paying, and they're all driving around in their Ferraris, and you're thinking, how come the stock market's an all-time high and my pension isn't an all-time high? Okay, because they're taking out their bits and they're putting into a narrow gene pool. Instead, you're going to look at the global universe and tick the boxes on value, growth, income, cash flow, okay, Sortino and Alpha, and that covers all of this. All right. Um, uh, Jazza said, not not all companies declare their performance figures. Really? 
Really? Every company has to, by law, which is listed on the stock market, uh, <laughs> provide their accounts. All of these things come from their accounts. Every single one of these issues comes from their accounts. If you've got companies which are not filing accounts, they're not listed on the stock market, my friend, okay? Every single company by law has to file its accounts in the UK every six months and in the US every quarter. So again, there's this all this inf misinformation which is out there, sadly, which people don't realize they've been misinformed about over years. Um, and the other thing I really is important, our strategy, now listen to me really carefully. What I'm teaching you, the solution to all your problems is this. Strategy is value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino Alpha, which is basically outperformance and volatility. Sortino is a measure of volatility, and Alpha is a measure of outperformance of the market. Right, and I'll go into these in a second. As long as the stocks fall in that, I do not care whether tactically you happen to pick companies which are in technology or in chocolates, whether they are in Britain or America, whether they are more volatile or less, but I will come to that, whether Warren Buffett owns them or not, and whether George Soros does or not, whether some analyst likes them or not, whether the, the, the journalists like them or not, or whether they're small cap or medium cap or large cap. The main problem and the reason people lose money is this, they think, Tactics are strategies. They pick based on tactics, not on strategy. In fact, they haven't got a bloody clue about strategy. What they'll do is they'll read something. They'll say, oh, I think I better have some, uh, better have some Japanese companies. Oh, I think oh, I read somewhere that this guru liked this company, so I'll buy it. Or oh, JP Morgan said they've got a buy rating on it. I'll buy it. That's a tactic. A tactic falls within a strategy. I don't care what your tactics are. The strategy has to be, does it, however, tick all, all, Val of my boxes, value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortina, alpha. And that's just part of them. I'm just summarizing it, okay? What's the output then? The output is this. Companies which fall the least in down markets and rebound the most in rising markets. That's what you're left with. And if you think about it, it would be that. But I'm going to show you proof of that in a second. It would be that because these are the kinds of companies which, which have got cash flow. So when the market falls, they don't fall as far. When it rebounds... They've got the benefit of their growth, their lower valuation. Do you see why they're going to fall less and rise more? Everyone's a genius in a rising market. Every every idiot looks clever, okay? And they mistake accident for skill. That's human nature, right? It's not how much you make, it's how much you get to keep. I'm more worried about when the market falls, will mine fall less? And when they rise, of course they're going to rise. I look like a bloody genius anyway. I'm not here to gamble on news. I'm not here to gamble on tactics. I'm here to invest on strategy. I'm not here to speculate on tactics, which is what everybody else does. 90% of companies, their speculation. I'm not a speculator, all right? It's not my business. I mean, if you said, I'm going to put a gun to your head, I want you to speculate on Bitcoin, Arpesh. Fine, you'll have to put a gun to my head first, though. I'm not in the business of speculation and gambling. I don't go to casinos. I don't go to Ladbrokes. I don't bet on horses either, okay? Money's too important to disrespect like that, I'm afraid. Forgive me if I sound moralistic right uh companies which fit the above a few about 10 percent. they're strong on profit growth dividends cash flow consistent sales growth fair valuation up performance. Now you might say, oh but Arpish, there's this company you've not mentioned which is rubbish in every regard but somebody speculated on it gamestop and it shot up yeah fine i've missed that i'll live with myself i'm all right thank you very much because guess what i sleep easy at night globank for instance tactically I've picked, why? Because strategically it fit everything, but tactically also hedge funds liked it. And I thought, oh, okay, that's an extra reason. It's a bit like you do an interview. The candidate's got everything going for them. You've got two identical candidates. One's got shiny shoes. You can't think of anything better reason to buy, uh, but to give the job because they're both identical. They've both got you know PhDs, came top of their class. So you go for the extra tactical tick box thing. Do you see how tactics and strategies work? So Globant, I happen to own. I'd buy it today. Cadence, I happen to own. I'd buy it today. Okay. All right. And it happens that we will, my team will say to me what the hedge funds are buying into. Uh, but I'll only buy into it, not because the hedge funds are buying into it, but because value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino Alpha, those other things have got to be there. They'll look at the news and they'll say to me, by the way, Alpesh, we're making the case for you because the news sentiment is positive on this. And they'll look at the various bits of news uh, uh, that they can see from everywhere, including tweets, 
But that's not why they're buying into it. It's because value, growth, income, cash flow, and this was just an extra nice to have. It's it's a little bit more reassuring. So what are we essentially doing? Well, this is from Goldman Sachs Asset Management. What we're doing, and it's very simple, uh, and to show you how simple it is, I'm showing you something about what Goldman Sachs do. So you don't think, oh, I bet they do some secret magic. Alpish is going to reveal. They don't do some secret magic, okay? They do exactly what I've just told you. And essentially what I've told you is another way of saying they look at management quality, sustainable leaders, industry positioning, right? This is from a presentation they gave me about a decade ago. Uh, uh, their current chairwoman, most people don't know this, the chairwoman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management is, as you put it in the chat box, tell me who, if you know who the chairwoman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management is, probably one of the most powerful women in Goldman Sachs, most powerful people in Goldman Sachs, happens to be a woman return on capital which is rare in finance by the way return on capital uh cash flow right they look at all these things this is probably the most important thing they look at so i'm going to share it with you because i ripped it off them i stole it i stand on the shoulders of giants okay and i'm going to share that with you and what that is in a second put in the chat box who you think is the chairwoman of goldman sachs asset management uh do the right sums to maximize your returns i've been saying this for years i want you to know this because that's an FT article I wrote in 2004 in my weekly columns. So I don't want you to think, oh, oh, Alpesh is just coming up with this now. And also because this software company, which independently verifies, they're independently verified. They've won all these awards from Financial Times for Investment and Wealth Management Awards year after year after year. They independently verified my picks since 2004. And they've been monitoring. And then that was 2004 when it was 34% return, 44% in 2005 and since. OK, and that's the returns, boom, 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 on what happens. So I've walked the talk and been independently verified uh, by Ionic, who's the software company who'd been doing that since 2004, independent of me. I'm not a shoulder in Ionic, OK? So let's get back into some of that. Like I said, that rich, poor divide. Let's close it. Uh, 12, 15, 25. Why did I say 15 stocks? Because basically, after you get past about 15 to 20, you've really eliminated portfolio risk, the volatility that you've got. Um, too much uh, concentration in one stock. Now you might say, no, 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 Alpesh, if I buy all 15 oil stocks, then I, I'm too concentrated. And I'd say, no, you're not too concentrated. You're an idiot. That's what you are if you buy all 15 in, in oil. Okay, so don't try and game the system and, and find a way of failing. Okay, for most private investors, they're going to end up picking, yeah, they might be a bit heavy on technology, but actually that'll probably be the right thing to do in any event because they're going to have looked at valuation growth income uh, cash flow Sortino Alpha, right? So how how long do you hold? Like I said, 12 months. If the markets are up, which is this bit, if they're up in 12 months, hey, you review and you say, right, you look at it all afresh and you say, would I hold on? What do I pick for the next 12 months? And it might be the ones you currently hold. Usually not. I don't usually continue holding them to the next year with the exception of some which have been held for ages like an Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, uh, Microsoft, I've held those for ages because each year they come up and it's like, oh, yeah, someone want those. Okay, but most others don't year on year out. After 12 months, I'm done with them. I've sucked the marrow out of them. Why? Because stocks move in cycles and they get overvalued over a 12 month period, especially with the type that I pick. And then the next year, I've got to pick a fresh batch, a bit like a football team. Okay, and if the market's down, okay, well, if it's a one of my quality stocks, which are the ones that I mentioned, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, well, I'm not going to sell them anyway. Uh, everywhere, Everything else, if it drops 25% from the highest it's been since I bought it, it's out into cash. Okay. Now, how does this kind of stuff fit in, this rich, poor divide? When Goldman Sachs sent me this on March the 26th, which you can look was the bottom of the market, okay? And they tell you that they're, caught, they're telling their people to buy uh, uh, into equities. Now, we get that information. But what does that tell you? Well, that's still not the reason why I've done it. I've got the message from Philip, but at the Beeb. So let me just have a look at, hey mate, uh, ba, 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 Lord Pellemore and I think we're okay. Uh, hey, hi from me. Yeah, Karen's always stepping hi from me. Uh, <laughs> he's a mate. Okay, so I won't be doing that. It'll be current instead. Um, uh, 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 so how do we fit that in? Well, it's tactics. Just because they said that doesn't mean I do it. It's a tactic instead all right uh problem number three your fund manager right this is the other problem problem number three um 
uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to share a joke with you. So Curran and I, Lord Billamo is now chairman of the CBI. We've been old friends. Um, tease him that you got him because you couldn't get me because you um, you couldn't get me. Uh, <laughs> uh, he'll like that as a joke. Now, your IFL fund manager has getting poor returns. We know this, right? So don't be fooled by their eight out of tens and their five diamonds and their A's rating. That's just a marketing gimmick. And this is this is a popular fund. I picked it from one of my students, and it says equity growth. And you think they must be doing real well. They're down three percent. Sorry, down two point three percent. That's pretty rubbish. Okay, and. They're saying to you they're going to give you an average return of 5% per annum. That's pretty rubbish. Right? It's why I hate fund managers. And this is what they hold. So that fund, the UK growth, held oil before oil prices fell to zero, well, $20, right? They held, uh, uh, they held British American tobacco and called it growth, right? No wonder they're getting 5%. They're promising you 5%. And this is the fees. This is their figures. Look it up. Look it up. Investment, £10,000. If you cash in after five years, total cost a thousand pounds. You are paying 10% on every 10K to your typical. That's a random typical fund that I picked. These are their numbers. This is a screenshot from them. Mark, you're right, Sheila Patel. Nicola Horlick? God's sake, whatever did happen to her? She's a long only fund manager who kept underperforming. Talked a good game though. Uh, yeah, Sheila Patel is the. Um, uh, Auntie Sheila is the chairwoman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Um, uh, uh, £1,000 in fees. Seriously? Well, I've just saved you £1,000 in fees by you doing it yourself, all right? You can be better than these overpaid fund managers. Honestly, and if you think I've got a big mouth and I'm full of myself and I and I say it, um, then, then this is the FT where I proved it. Uh, for them over a 12 month period, not over a day, not over a week, over a 12 month period. I've also won competition on Channel 4, Show Me the Money, and on Bloomberg TV's uh, uh, programs as well on stock selection. All right. Uh, that's 2004, and Woodford came bottom. I came top. The FTSE had to write then Patel is top FTSE 100 forecaster uh, because we had to. Uh, we we had to do it publicly, obviously, transparently. And that was in the FT. Uh, and then several years later, he was found out for being rubbish. We knew he was rubbish a long time ago in the industry, but everybody else didn't. The retail client didn't, because guess what? Retail clients buy on name recognition. 2004, you didn't know Alpish Patel, but you knew Neil Woodford. So that's what happened. And by the way, in case you think I'm, this is all new that I'm saying, I'm not, Right. The this is my column in the FT in 1999, 19 bloody 99. You can tell I had hair back then. Uh, there, what does that say? That says sell up your UK holdings and buy only US stocks. It was my way of saying increase that gene pool of what you're picking. And the UK markets are at 1999 levels today in 2021. The US, no. They're not. And I'm not just saying simply buy US willy nilly valuation, growth, income, cash flow uh, uh, as well. You've got to look at that and Sortino and Alpha. When to sell? I've solved it for you. I told you 12 months or if it drops 25 percent. Why 12 months? This is from Goldman Sachs Asset Management's research to show why 12 months. So how are we going to solve this? Well, look, I said value, growth, income, Sortino, Alpha. Within that, tactically, you might have sub strategies. We have sub strategies within that you might so i'm going to look at the guru buy so let's look at some of these guru buys okay these are gurus okay uh bill gates <laughs> i did this before he announced his divorce which i'm really saddened and shocked by uh because i actually thought they were a lovely ideal couple so it's, it's a bit depressing actually uh to see him get divorced anyway him and melinda uh get divorced so that's bill gates 22 billion in just the stocks obviously he's got other things which build up his wealth right and we're not talking his microsoft holding uh number of stocks he has in his portfolio 24 or warren buffett uh 228 billion 49 stocks what are now just because they own it doesn't mean that tactically because he owns apple i'm more reassured because i've got apple on my value growth thing now i'll tell you which other ones i own i happen to own fiserv now just because one of the gurus owns it i own google or alphabet okay um, so what I'm saying is, I don't care anymore. And I don't want you to care that just because they own it, I own Microsoft. And I'll tell you others I own. 
we will tactically also look at hedge fund ownership reports. And yes, yes, whilst looking at these, we will say, okay, we'll say that, uh, 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 we'll say that uh, uh, a lot of hedge funds are buying them, but it's still got to meet our value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino. Alpha, I'm sorry to be laboring the point like a boring school teacher, but it is important. Now, out of these, which do I happen to own? I don't own Etsy, but I wish I had. Electronic Arts, I own. Um, I because uh, I can't buy everything. I own T Row Price, and I uh, and that's it from that list. And hopefully, I don't have anything on the securities drop list. But if I did, I don't care because it's up to my. I don't care that I'd be going against what the hedge funds are doing in any event. Okay. Uh, what are the latest Warren Buffett trades? I don't care what he's bought, but in case.